very good evening and welcome to this evening's episode of the state of our nation tonight on the back of the platinum strike we bring you an exclusive interview with Joseph Matunjwa, the president of AMCU. We also bring you researchers who have done extensive work in this area of work who tell us whether we've seen the last of the kinds of crippling strikes like the one we have just seen on the platinum belt. First up though, that interview with Joseph Matunjwa. Mr. Matunjwa, thank you very much for joining us. In your own words, this afternoon it was grueling, but you believe you fought a good fight. It is correct. I think it's a good summation of what has happened. 400 years, our workers being shackled under poverty. So in five months, we managed to cut those shackles and liberate ourselves. We are in the right track towards a better living for mine workers. But what do you think you, 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 you achieved that you could not have possibly achieved if you had stuck to just looking at you know, the annual wage increment and that sort of thing? Yeah, we've been dealing with a structural wage uh, of which was designed mainly for black mine workers in South Africa, from colonization to the National Party and to the new dispensation of which we haven't been attending it so much. So therefore, there is no worker in the platinum sector who will be employed on a basic salary that is below 8,000 rand a month. Now, from where, I mean, we were chatting earlier to a representative of Lonmen who believes that um, whatever may have been the union's spin on this, the fact of the matter is that it's a lose-lose agreement. He thinks workers have lost something they will never be able to regain, and so have um, um, the, the, the mining companies. I think in the struggle, you may count for now that we have lost, but if you look at the future, we have addressed the future as I was saying that there will be no worker will be employed earning 4,500 anymore. So therefore, those are the gains. Beyond this, as a country, you yourselves as worker leaders, um, everybody is going to be dealing with the impacts or the socio-economic impact of mining in South Africa, something everybody acknowledges um, has not been dealt with. Now, from what uh, President Zuma said in his State of the Nation address, this is a matter that now needs urgent attention. From speaking to the mining companies on the back of your agreement, they too agree that this is something that needs to be addressed. How confident are you that um, it's going to go beyond lip service, and this is something that's going to happen. And hopefully, the, what we saw, or the gains that were made during the strike, will then begin to nudge people closer to delivering on those socio-economic um, demands of workers. I think one, uh, the government should be the one that are, are implementing all the legislations uh, that they've passed especially in the mining sector, the social labor plan, the MPRDA, and all what it contains has to be implemented without favor or fear, of which we know very well that some of these mining houses, they are not in compliance with such uh, legislations. So I think that will be a wake-up call for the government to see to it that these mining houses, they don't escape the threat of the law in terms of compliance. And secondly, I think it's also an opportunity for the government to say to these mines, you cannot close the mine for the sake of profit. The minerals are to serve the nation, so the profit must come before the nation. So any mines that are going to be closed because they are, they've been alleged that they are not making profit, the government must take the license back and give it to others will be able to mine on those marginal 
uh, lines. What in your analysis uh, have been the reasons for the government's reluctance to do the right thing? I think somehow uh, one will be tempted to say incompetency is part of it. And uh, moreover, I think uh, some of leaders of the government, as we quite aware, it's known that they are be partners to these mines. Of as a result, uh, the compliance is not monitored. Uh, but given just how complicated and uh, politics in this country tends to be, to what extent do you think that the goings on? within the ruling party, but also uh, given that some of the people in leadership roles within um, the ANC are in fact, as you say, shareholders in some of these mining companies. Would you say that is what is probably the cause for government to, be, to not do what they are supposed to be doing? I think that is it, because I mean, you cannot pass the law and at the same time you don't want to look at the compliance side of it. So I think there is biasness and favoritism uh, in implementation. Uh, if you make some research, you'll find some of the mines they are operating without water license, of which is one of the priority uh, before you open the mine. So therefore, uh, I think once the the government try to distance itself, in particular those who are holding high offices, not to be part and parcel of the BE dealings. I think we can see more stringent measures taken against those that they don't want to comply. In the past five months, a lot has been said about you and how you conduct yourself or how this, the AMCO has conducted itself. In your view from where you sit, because listening to you this afternoon, you were talking about how you were vilified as a union, how you, you were disrespected, um, but you also spoke about the humility, but also the support your own members gave you, given the mandate that they had given you. Do you think that there's a disjuncture, in other words, in the way the media and uh, perhaps p certain quarters, you know, present you, uh, the kind of person they, 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 they seem to suggest you are, and who you actually are. I think that is correct. Uh, I think that is what we've experienced. The issue was about the mandate given to us as a leadership to present to the employers. But as the strike continued, we saw the media shifting the focus to becoming more personal. You could see clearly that it was a well-orchestrated strategy to distract uh, the, I mean, our members, not to focus on what they were aiming at, but uh, through God's grace and uh, through their steadfastness, uh, they were focused. They were never detracted from their position to this far. But from where you sit, you can, you, with a clean conscience, say you have done nothing wrong. You have done nothing wrong to the cause of the workers. You have done nothing wrong in terms of how you spent workers' money. It is. I mean, I mean you'll remember, uh, AMCO is, is quite a small union as compared to others, but uh, its record speaks volume. Secondly, during the strike, we managed to pop about two million rand uh, to start up a strike fund in addition from the one million that we put before. And uh, you remember during the strike Easter weekend, uh, we paid buses over three million to take all workers to the four corners of the country, all provinces for Easter weekend, and we maintained them to come back. Subsequent to that, uh, many of our members lost their uh, parents AMCO was there giving them a uh, funeral uh, cover in terms of money for, I mean, to conduct those services. Others, uh, the ch uh, their kids or their children were taken out from school because of the school fees. AMCO came to the rescue. Others, they were in errors in terms of bonds uh, that they were given letters that they must evacuate their houses. AMCO came to the rescue. Others were about cars. AMCO paid those, uh, what's name, those installment from different banks. So therefore, I think AMCO has spent the money of the workers even from limited resources, but we managed to pull through to all those challenges. And the Department of Labor, I think they've made the record clear that 
there's nothing that you can point from AMCO in terms of finances. As a union, um, where to from here? What do you think has been the impact of the strike on your union? I think uh, the impact uh, to the union is that uh, workers, they will believe the leadership of AMCO and uh, in its objectives. As a union that listens to its membership, the union that respects the mandate from its members. You've seen many instances whereby everyone was blaming me that I'm the one who doesn't want to get workers back to work. But through the mass meeting, when I was uh, taking the mandate from, they were steadfast. And until such time yesterday, the world see itself that Matundra is not that is the one, but are the workers who own the union. So they gave us a mandate to go and sign. Hence, then the strike, I mean, has been terminated. Uh, with an agreement that the workers, our members, felt that uh, is quite uh, uh, convincing. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. SABC News, we've got Africa covered. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're speaking to the man who led South Africa's longest strike. He's unapologetic. Joseph Matunjwa says, given a chance, he will do it all over again. He believes Amku fought a good fight and has a lot to show for it. The economist, uh, most of the economists that were analyzing the strike have never had any economists supporting the working class. And I think because some of them, they are shareholders in these companies. So they've got an A agenda that they are pursuing. And again, if you look at the job losses, it's not only strikes that cause job losses. How many mines have been mothballed to date that there was no strike? So, I mean, that's, that's where we are very concerned, or should we say that is where the government intervention is so important to tell these mines that the game has changed. We, you investors, you are not here to create division and poverty in our country. This mineral has to be distributed equally and benefit the majority of the people of this country. So I think that's a challenge. Your, 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 your industrial policies and all your foreign uh, policies, uh, your economic policies, all those things, uh, I think the government should look uh, into that and see to it that how do they benefit the majority of these people, I mean of the people of South Africa. If you had to look back or retrace your steps um, over the past five months, is there something you would have done differently? That's of course with the benefit of hindsight. No, I think the only thing is that uh, if we had a strike fund before, uh, that's the only thing, that next time we have to build our strike fund to have more money uh, to sustain our members from different challenges during the strike. But for the cause itself, it was a good cause. We don't regret. I think many people, they've learned from it, many formations of the union, they learn how, how important it is to respect your members and its mandate and to deal with the mandate of the workers without fear or favor. And again, it's all very nice if your conscience is clear. AMCO national leadership doesn't own any legions to any companies. So we are free. The money that, the salaries that we get is from the same workers. So why should we fear to represent them? Because they are putting food on my table. They are feeding my family through the salary I'm getting from AMCO. So therefore, if they give me work to do, why should I do the half work of it? Uh, 
And you're not talking about the strike fund because perhaps um, you ended up compromising, in other words, um, reaching a settlement that otherwise you would not have reached were it not for perhaps your members being compelled to go back to work. Our members were not really compelled to go to work. I mean, if you were part of the, the meetings, all the mass meetings, our members were energetic, uh, they were, and we never persuade them to say, accept this agreement. Uh, they just realized that from the last 20 years, it's the first of the agreement that they ever reached. Uh, they normally get 150, 200 rand, 300 rand. Recently, uh, with Anglo, NUM signed a two-year agreement whereby the lowest paid employee was getting 400 rand, of which a worker who's earning uh, 4,000 rand, for instance, it will take him two years to earn 4,800. And then when you look how we push during this five months period, uh, no worker will be earning less than 8,000 in three years. So I think it's a job well done. It's a breakthrough. We haven't achieved as we would like to, but I think uh, we've done exceptionally well, especially our members of becoming so steadfast to their position. Thank you very much for talking to us and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we also spoke to employers on the enormous damage that they believe the strike may have caused. And contrary to what AMCU believes, some of the companies involved in the crippling strike believe no one has won. Lonmin, for its part, believes that it is irresponsible for anyone, including AMCU, to claim victory. Well, thanks very much for um, joining us, and uh, we hope um, this settlement is going to usher in uh, a new era, which will hopefully, um, where we'll hopefully never get back um, to what has been the longest strike. Thank you. It is not a great record for, for the industry, neither is it a great record for the country. You know, there are so many good things we could do, and this is not one of them. But um, it also talks to the reality of the challenges we have in the structural uh, system in our labor markets. Um, the good thing about, for me, the, the, the best thing about this whole situation is that we've seen the defects in our labor market. We've seen the defects in the industry. It is a, a good crisis we've had. We must not lose it. We must use it to learn uh, and improve. Take, take us through those defects. What for you um, are the key defects that you've identified, that you identified, that this process helped you, uh, the strike helped you identify? Uh, the main one, which is the saddest of the lot, is that um, our, our rights are actually, uh, with the best constitution in the country, cannot be fully um, uh, protected, neither can they be fully exercised. Uh, we've seen in the, in the and it's, we, it's commonplace, we've accepted it, but I think here in the platinum industry it's shown that it doesn't work. The rights of other workers to strike should not infringe on the rights of others not to strike. Um, the fact that how we relate and communicate to our employees uh, and how we leave it up to the unions to manage that relationship, that is also something that has come up. The Labor Relations Act in terms of, and in terms of what it allows for, for strikes, strike certificates, uh, government role. I mean, you've seen how government wanted to intervene, but they were hamstrung because of the very act that they actually protect, that they, they promulgated. So those are all the issues that have come out, um, let alone the issues then of uh, the, the effect of the migration system and the history in mining that has caused this whole uh, big uh, issue. The migrant system, uh, the housing uh, system, the dual families, those are all the structural issues that are in this labor market. We'll today. get into those um, structural um, issues, but one of the things that were said today, um, and it was the ink had hardly dried. Uh, some economists coming forward saying that there's definitely going to job losses. Um, one of them saying that estimating that actually a third of the jobs could go in the platinum belt. Realistically, I, uh, economics is a science and it works in a strange way. Uh, but the reality of a business and operating is something else. Notwithstanding that the companies all along while noticing that and, and keeping and making public note that we could suffer job losses if this goes on for too long, we are not. We are trying very hard, and we have tried 
to keep as many jobs as we can. And we are taking off from a position where we want to minimize if there's going to be any, any job losses. Um, it's not about job losses. We need to talk about getting the businesses to where they are profitable. So we have to look at how we start up. We have to look at the safety of the uh, underground uh, projects. We have to look at uh, capital investments going forward. Those are all the factors. Until you've done those sums, you can't talk about uh, restructuring or job losses. But as things stand with what you know, given how or what it takes um, to do what you have to do, which is mining, does that possibility exist at all or to a lesser or greater extent, but does that possibility it's, exist? It's, it's not a straight answer. As I said, it, it could, it could not be. We, will, we want to try and mitigate that as much as possible. Our workers have suffered enough. We don't want them to suffer anymore. So we'll try our best to make sure that we can mitigate for those. Um, the reality is it has never happened in South Africa that uh, mines are not operating for five months. So we have, no, um, the, the, we have no record of this before. It's unprecedented. We'll only see when we're at the ground and we're looking at the, cold, uh, the, the rock face, and we can determine. Now, from where the mine workers um, sit or stand, um, this has been... Yes, um, um, as much as it was grueling uh, from what uh, uh, Joseph Matunjwa told us, it was a good fight, certainly from where workers stand, because it went deeper than the surface. Um, they spoke of, they, they at least got you guys to move wider and deeper than would have been the case if we were just talking about you know the annual increment and that sort of thing is that is that is is that your view i think such a statement actually borders on the mischievous um i we don't think that the workers have won we don't think that the mines have won we don't we think actually everybody has lost from the mine from the miners uh, to the mine to the to the companies to the country to the economy our credibility and our rating has gone down so we have lost on all counts. So anybody who wants to claim a victory, it's actually, if there is a victory, it's a hollow victory. Um, the workers have lost an income that they'll never get back. Um, we now have to struggle and work very hard to make sure that workers retain their jobs. We have to work very hard. And all those things talk, for instance, to the fact that we need investors to put more money in. But we have no credibility. So we have, we have almost, you know, killed the very goose that is supposed to lay the egg. So it, is, it, is, it, 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 is, it borders on being mischievous to say we, somebody has won anything. We, we need to rebuild. Um, we need to work harder. If we put down what we believed would actually resolve the situation. But we know that for sustainability purposes, we all have to dig deeper than we would have under any normal circumstances. Now, let's talk then beyond this point, and apart from sort of strictly like shop, shop floor issues, the socio-economic um, um, stuff that um, you miners are, in fact, I mean, you uh, uh, companies are being accused um, of not really adhering to or even uh, it's something um, that uh, um, it's being said you don't even give a damn about. Yes, I don't know. The socio-economic issues are the very main drivers of the things that we are doing at the moment. I mean, for instance, as we sit here, we are aware that our mine workers who live in the rural areas who are in the Eastern Cape and in the neighboring countries have no money to come back to work. It's been five months without an income. We are going to be sending out transport. We are actually calling on them to approach the nearest DEBA offices, and they will get assistance on getting back to work. Um, and we want us to be responsible for that because if we leave it to them, they will then go to loan sharks and get worse into debt. So we are looking after issues like that, issues such as housing. But isn't that because, oh, sorry, on the first mm -hmm. one, um, isn't that because you want them to come to work so that you can catch up on what you've lost? Uh, remember, I mean, at the end of the day, it is their prerogative to come to work. It's not the employer's responsibility to get anybody to work, but we are making it our responsibility because we realize that the situation they're in is, is, is an uh, is an uncanny one. So we, we are going beyond our uh, you know, duty as an employer. Um, and uh, then the other issue I want to talk about is the issue of housing that everybody yeah. harps on. Just on that, here's mm. what the president um, had to say around this issue. To further promote, improve living conditions for mine workers, government is monitoring the compliance of mining companies with mining charter targets 
relati relating to improving the living conditions of workers. <clears throat> Companies are expected to convert or upgrade hostels into family units, attain the occupancy rate of one person per room, and also facilitate home ownership options for mine workers. <clears throat> we urge companies to meet the 2014 deadline for these targets and extend this right to dignity to mine workers. He wouldn't be saying that if you guys were delivering on that, would he? Well, you know, it's a huge industry. We are, a, we are, we are big employers. Um, we're talking about 70,000 AMC members that have been on strike. We actually, this strike has affected 136,000 workers. That is a, quite a huge number. Um, and those are people we need to house and make sure that they're accommodated, because most of them came to these mines when it was basically virgin open land. So we are talking about actually delivering housing at a very huge scale. So that is why you know, the, old, the old mining houses used to use hostels to solve this problem. And we are not talking about something that is, 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 is short term. And we are not the only mines. There are, there's the gold sector, Certainly, there are other yeah, sectors. Yeah. So I would imagine the president's problem concerns be, go beyond platinum. But I can tell you for Lonmin, because I can speak on behalf of Lonmin, um, we are actually converting our very last block of hostels. The last remaining block would have actually been completed by now had it not been for the strike. Uh, into family units. So we have eradicated hostels as Lonmin. We have uh, donated land to the, we are working in partnership with government, Department of, so of our, um, uh, Human Settlements. We have given them land to make sure that they can provide housing, not only for the mine workers, but also for the neighboring communities that have sprung around uh, the mining uh, area. So in terms of our SLP targets, we have actually gone beyond the targets. We are now looking really responsibly at the, at the community around us. It is a huge challenge. I mean, uh, the numbers are huge, but I, I think we, we are on track. So we, we have acted responsibly around that. But um, obviously, there are other players in the sector who, are, who we know are still straddling behind. But as I say, it is a huge challenge that unfortunately was not, was not um, actually addressed at the time when, in, in the apartheid days, when there was lots of money, when the profits were huge, when the prices were great. That could have been addressed then, but it wasn't. Now we've got to look at it and try and resolve it. I keep saying. Um, for, 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 for the unions now to try and push companies to say overnight give us accommodation is almost like asking for reparation. So we need, it, 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 housing is not easy to deliver. You can look at government. They have all the money and all the muscle. It's been difficult because infrastructure, water, you've got to look at all other factors. But as far as SLPs are concerned, we are on track and beyond. Well, the guys at Rutgers University are saying you could have actually done this or you could have lo moved a lot faster um, if you hadn't paid the exorbitant amounts of money that you've given to your shareholders and to your chief executives and the like. Well, uh, again, talking broadly, but I can tell you for Lonmin, Lonmin at the moment owes its shareholders $800 million. And we have to go back to ask for probably a minimum of 200 again. Um, because what, if you look over the past five years, uh, they have put in $1.4 million billion into Lonmin. They've only been paid back for uh, $700 million. So we, w those uh, monies people are talking about, it's just, again, people talking uh, without any facts. So Lonmin, at the moment, we haven't paid out anything. Instead, our shareholders have been putting more money because they believe in the future sustainability of the mine. That is why we're very concerned about sustainability, and we'll try and do our best to make sure that that gets met. From our side, we, we are pushing on the housing uh, delivery. But remember, delivering a house is not for just putting up brick and mortar. Uh, there's got to be water, there's got to be electricity, there's got to be sanitation. All those factors come into play. That's why we are partnering with uh, human settlements, because they, they, at the end of the day, government delivers those services, and they form part of what we need to do. Well, for our country's sake, please be as good as your word. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
says, and contrary to what Joseph Matunjwa believes, some economists are adamant that job losses are imminent. The mining is now at its lowest level since 2010. It's very likely that a third, around about a third, of the jobs in the platinum sector is going to disappear. The mines are going to go to the more mechanized eastern mm -hmm. rim of the platinum belt, and there they do production, 340 uh, Amplats mine, 340,000 ounces with 6,000 people. The other 40,000 people produce a half a million ounces, that's true, but it means you need, um, you know, uh, uh, roughly six times the people to get a 50% increase. Um, that shows you it's going to go to mechanization soon. Well, well, well. Well, this conversation, of course, continues. We're looking at the aftermath of uh, that platinum sector wage deal. After the break, we speak to people who have done a lot of research work who are going to talk to us about the socio-economic situation of mine workers and whether, in fact, on the back of this deal, that problem is going to be looked into by all involved. That's after this short ad break. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. So, have we seen the end of such crippling strikes? Have we learned any lessons? We take this story beyond today's headlines to some of the underlying causes of a crimony between workers and their bosses. Two researchers who have done extensive work in the area of socioeconomic issues affecting mine workers share their thoughts. This is how our conversation went. David Gavin, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Bui, for having us. <clears throat> well, the strike may be over, but the consequences of the strike are going to be with us for some time to come. Um, yes, indeed. I think that um, the workers uh, on platinum mines and so on will have um, received uh, great comfort from the fact that the strike is, is now over and that they seem to have one within a three-year period, what they thought they would win immediately, um, but they made the concession very early on in the strike to say we'll do it over three years rather than five years, and the strike could have been settled at that time already if 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 if, if management had had come in. But it must have given great confidence to mine workers in South Africa that they can actually push for better wages. If you consider that the wages of South African workers compared to mine, mine workers in other parts of the world like Australia and so on are not really comparable. Like Mr. Kutifani says, they pay Australian mine workers five times more than they pay South African mine workers. So in a sense, it, it allows for um, us to move towards uh, the global standard as far as mine labor is concerned, um, rather than to be trapped in this cheap labor economy that we are now. Well, the counter argument mm -hmm. uh, from some quarters is that they are not as skilled. South African workers are not as skilled as, say, Australians. Well, yes. Uh, if we look at the Wall Street Journal and we look at Bloomberg, um, there are two articles there where one article is about a high school dropout in Australia earning 2.2 million a year. Um, um, rands, uh, that's 220,000 Australian dollars. Now, he's a high school dropout. One wonders about the skills issue. And a truck driver on an Australian mine earns uh, 1.5 million a year. And to drive a Volvo requires exactly the same skills in South Africa as it does in Australia. So it's a nonsense argument. It's a fallacious <laughs> argument. Yeah. Devon? Um, what, what, I mean, for you, I mean, from where you sit, 
um, certainly from the research um, that you guys have conducted. Yes, you're saying you don't know the real situation as things stand, but not too long ago, I mean, these mining companies could pay their shareholders, they could pay their um, chief executives and other group executives like enormous loads and loads of cash. So they probably are able to actually pay um, these workers what they're asking for. Yeah, I think so, Vuyo. I think one actually important thing to say about the way in which the settlement has opened up is, unfortunately, we weren't able to get to the end of the process which was mediated by the Minister of Mineral Resources. And I say unfortunately because at the beginning of those negotiations, you'll recall, um, one of the first things the Minister said was, we are here as an honest broker. Um, we want all parties to understand where the other parties are coming from. And because of that, we want the mining houses to open up their books and for there to be real scrutiny of whether what sort of pay rise they can and can't afford. And that never happened. So up until this point, we don't actually know, in terms of their own internal figures, what they can and can't afford. And I would suggest until we know that, it's going to be very, very hard to say what is an achievable wage within the mining sector. Is it realistic, though, to expect these people to open their books? There's also another charge, the charge of underselling and all those things. Uh, are we being realistic when we say um, we need that to happen because someone will argue it will never happen? Well, I, I think if you're going to have a negotiation with the other party in good faith, you have to understand the other party's information. That's the only way in which you can negotiate in good faith. It would have been quite possible to ring fence that process of so that information which is market sensitive didn't get out of the negotiating chamber there are many ways in which that could have been done that happens in courts all the time so so i think we, we use the term fallacious i think it's a fallacious argument that this couldn't happen it should have happened and maybe what this points to is that for a longer term and fair assessment within the South African mining industry, there needs to be a proper government in commission of inquiry into what the profits really are, what the international selling figures really are, and what the affordability really is. At the moment, we honestly don't know. And inquiry, what else do you think, well, um, well, think um, could actually help so that well, everyone... I, I think that uh, if we look at the strike, it's a five-month-long strike, and the platinum price hasn't moved much over five months, despite the fact that no one's been working. In 2008, when you had the uh, ESCOM outages, um, the load shedding, the platinum price shot up to $2,000 an ounce. Yet this time around, platinum stopped altogether. Almost 60% of production stopped, but the price didn't move, which means that there must have been massive um, stockpiling yes. of inventories that took place between 2009 and now. And that would suggest to me that uh, we are not quite sure of how much platinum was exported from this country during that time that could feed the market. Statistics South Africa two weeks ago announced that the year-on-year -year increase in production in May was 30%, but there was no production. How could there so be an increase in, you know, how could that happen? So these are things that need to come out into the open because as a country, we need to benefit from our mining. Mining is not sustainable in the sense that um, 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 raw materials are not renewable. When you finish with minerals, they're gone. And if we don't actually take control of the situation, we will wake up one morning, there will be no more platinum, and we will not have benefited as we should have. Do you think that the government is the custodian mm. you know, of, of, our, of the nation's resources? are as vigilant um, as, as they should perhaps be? Well, I don't think that they're vigilant at all. I think that um, the mining industry gets away with breaking the law in this country very frequently. You know, I, I can talk about environmental compliance, I can talk about social and labour plans, I can talk ar around a ar whole range of issues. Uh, for example, the use it or lose it principle that operates in this country according to the MPRDA, the Minerals and Petroleum Resource Development Act. We've got 6,000 abandoned mines in this country. Now, many of these mines are mothballed, so to speak, mothballed. So they're not being used, they're not being used productively, they're just lying there. And yesterday we saw a major accident in Benoni that killed, not an accident, a fight between 
between gang wars over illegal mining at a mothballed mine. Now, there shouldn't be such a thing as a mothballed mine. There should either be a closed mine or a mine that has been given to someone who's willing to operate it. Now, we, we, we're sitting with a highly monopolized mining industry in this country where three companies dominate platinum, five companies dominate gold, five companies dominate coal. And, 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 and we talk about economic empowerment for the majority of people in this country. And so long as this domination by this small group of transnational corporations continue, there will be no empowerment. But what for you, uh, Aaron, are the benefits for Abwaza? I think, I mean, someone watching um, in this discussion um, we're having now is going to think, oh, a couple of white lefties <laughs> trying very hard to be, you know, relevant. Um, what do you think people are missing? Because at some point I got a sense um, that it was in, there was a lot of sort of us and them. There was a lot of, um, you know, it's these miners, AMCO, belonging to mm -hmm. AMCO, sort of fighting this endless um, war up against a formidable enemy and they shouldn't even be trying for that matter. Is there a social or a, a sort of broader South Africa benefit to the arguments that you are making that by correcting these wrongs, these are the benefits to the country? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think one of the effects or one of the social effects of, of the strike has been that it's opened a lid on something people felt was happening but didn't really have the language to speak about. And that's basically the widening inequality within South African society. And this has absolutely shone a light on that. And what it's highlighted and started to bring, probably not enough, but started to bring into the public domain and public conversation is, on the one hand, um, the absolute desperation, actually, that many workers and the unemployed face within their daily lives and the lengths to which they're forced to go um, to achieve something approaching a decent standard of living. But on the other side of the coin, the immense profits which are being made from the South African economy, which are being shipped out overseas. I mean, if I could just quote a figure at you, um, during um, our independent research, nothing to do with lefties, but our independent research at Wits University showed that during the platinum boom of 2000 and 2008, the operating profit margins of Amplats, Implats and Blondmin were 37%, sorry, 44% and 41% respectively. Now, these were some of the most profitable companies in the world during that time. And they were also companies whose shareholders are broadly international, particularly Amplats, 80% of it being held by Anglo-American, which is now headquartered in London. So that money was going straight out of the South African economy and not benefiting people here. So really, all the time we're being told that the South African economy is uncompetitive, that foreign companies don't want to invest here, but actually they do, and they do it because they know they can squeeze real money out of this economy, and the people here are not seeing the benefit, and that's why we're having strikes like we've had over the past five months. Well, gentlemen, we're going to take a quick ad break. This conversation continues. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. SABC News, we've got Africa covered. Welcome back, and if you've just joined us, we're in conversation talking about the plight of mine workers in this country. The platinum strike may be over, but the socio-economic ills that come with mining are far from over. Now, let me come back to you, um, David. Now, you guys have done a lot of research work around mm. the socio-economic conditions of mm. mine workers mm. in this country. And um, where do you, I think everyone knows about like lack of housing, you're talking about mm. single sex mm. hostels at some mm. point, which mm. although the situation has changed, mm. but it hasn't really changed drastically from what it was during, mm. during apartheid. You're talking mm. about health issues, but also um, um, the, the, you know, long after these, uh, the big conglomerates will have mm. taken the minerals mm. um, from underground, you, mm. get, you have these 
ghost towns mm. um, that you can do very little, if anything, mm. about. Mm. Well, I think that, first of all, it's, it's, it's a tragedy that you have to travel through a sea of poverty to get to any mine in South Africa. You can go onto Google Earth, you can Google any mine, and you'll find the informal settlement next door. And that's where the mine workers mainly stay. One of the reasons for that is that um, in, in transforming the hostels into family accommodation, actually much fewer workers can be accommodated than used to be accommodated. And these workers simply then end up in informal settlements because we've got a huge housing shortage in South Africa, particularly in an area like um, Rustenburg. And so also most of the township development is usually far away from mines, you know, and so workers would not want to travel long distances to get to the mines. And they also do not buy into the housing schemes of mining companies where the mining company gets a bank loan on behalf of the worker and the worker has to pay off the bank loan and then live in an RDP house somewhere. Because the worker, being a migrant worker, his commitment to spending his money is in the Eastern Cape. Back it's home. not mm. back home. It is not, it's not in Rustenburg. He does not want to set up anything permanent in Rustenburg. And, and the housing through, through the bank system is actually a form of labor control because you lose the house if you go on strike, you lose the house if you are retrenched, and it brings a whole lot of insecurities with it as well. You know, so this is why there's no uptake on the housing schemes from mining companies. They, they would have to think, rethink that and think about building proper rental accommodation for mine workers that mine workers can rent while they are actually uh, um, um, living uh, in proximity to the mine and working in the mine before they actually go home to the Eastern Cape where they will invest their money. And you will see in the labor sending in areas, they do invest their money in very good housing and so on where they come from. So you can understand why the workers are resistant to the current model that the, that the, that the mining companies are proposing. I think one of the problems with the mining companies is they don't ask people what they want. Mm -hmm. They are very paternalistic mm -hmm. and tell people what the solutions to these problems are instead of listening to what it is that people want. I think if there's a, a, a more open door policy towards workers, they would actually be able to resolve some of these things that confront them year after year after year and we go through the cycle either of strikes or retrenchment or whatever because simply uh, it would seem as if uh, people are so intent on perpetuating the cheap labor economy that they can't actually see beyond their own interest, beyond, beyond uh, you know, the door of the manager. But is it being paternalistic or is it really a question of them wanting to spend per worker as little as possible? Because if you ask the worker what they want, they're going to tell you, going to give you a long list of what they want and you're not going to be, because they're going to mm -hmm. ask you perhaps mm -hmm. to actually mm -hmm. help them um, achieve mm -hmm. that you're not, and you are not keen to pay for that, so you're not going to... Well, I think that... I think that workers in South Africa are not, um, you know, they're not unrealistic in their demands at all. You know, um, if a coal worker in Australia can earn uh, 2.2 million a year uh, and coal sells at much lower prices than platinum and there's no monopoly of coal in, 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 in Australia, um, you know, uh, then, 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 then the demand for 12,500 really is reasonable. And if we look at the settlement, housing is included in the settlement. People are saying we want the mines to sort out this housing mess. You know, in, in the informal settlement next to, next to the um, mine in Marikana where the, 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 the tragedy occurred in 2012, uh, workers get water once a day at 12 o'clock at night. You know, and sometimes they don't get water at all. In a community that I was in in Limpopo last week, they get water once a week. Mm. You know, um, these are inhuman, inhumane conditions. You know, and then the bosses will tell you, but these workers are not productive; they don't deserve. But you, how can you be productive under those circumstances? If you want workers to be more productive, you better look after them much better than what you're doing at the moment. Now, from what um, I mean, that uh, vets. I mean, Stardi, um, you know, has, 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 has told us, um, Kevin, is there something, uh, something more important, something that would have really made a huge difference mm -hmm. that um, these mining companies could have done mm -hmm. um, before we even got to this platinum strike? Is there something, and I'm talking about mining companies broadly mm -hmm. and in the, in the broader sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are things that both the mining companies could have done, but there are also things that the state could have done as well to ensure that mining works um, for, for the common good, for the national good, as opposed to any one sector. Let's start with what they could have done themselves. So, so with the mining companies themselves, I, I think the first thing without question would have been decent pay. That's obvious. That's why there's been a strike, and that's what's been missing Most historically for the, for the industry for over a century. 
But as well, then there's the question of housing. And the question of housing is quite complex, as David was pointing out. Um, I mean, as you know, uh, in, in its classical model, the migrant labour system involved mine workers living in compounds and eating food which was provided by the company. So in other words, this was a cost which was taken on by the company. Of course, the standard of that accommodation of food was absolutely abysmal, but nevertheless, it was a cost to company which then acted as a subsidy to the cheap wages. What we've seen is a kind of transitional period with the hostel upgrading and other schemes, but that's then moved into the, the thing of the living out allowance, which workers generally have incorporated into their wages because they're so low, and then have rented a backyard or something in the areas or, or, or constructed a shack to reduce their living mm. costs there. So then suddenly this massive housing gap opens up. Really, there's another argument, and the argument could have been that what the employers could have done and should have done was to have built massive, cheap-cost rental housing, and not even rental housing, actually. If they were going to keep on paying the, the same low wages, then that should have been free, mm. just, as, just as the housing had been mm. free in the past. It should have remained a cost to the company, mm. or alternatively, they should have paid a living wage in the sense that you and I get one, which means that we have within our wage the, the money to have buy, buy decent mm. housing. And from a uh, government point of view, what could government have done or done better? Well, gov government, for a start, could have actually compelled the mining houses to make these changes. Um, on paper, the, the, the powers that the government has over mining now are considerable because of the mine, license, li mine licensing system, which is brought in with the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act. You know, there are a whole number of social measures which could be enforced, and if you don't do it, we're going to take away your licence and we're going to give, you to so give it to somebody else who will. They haven't really used that, and I think one of the questions is why haven't they used the instruments which are already available to them? That's one thing. But on top of that, there's a taxation system as well. It is actually ANC policy, which came in through the state intervention in the Mineral Sector Report, which the ANC commissioned and, and adopted at the Maon Conference, which actually says that if mining profits get above 15%, we are going to tax those heavily. It's called a resources rent tax. And we are going to put that money back into society and the economy for developmental purposes. And remember the percentages I spoke about earlier. 37%, 44%, 41% profits. Mm. Can you imagine how much mm. money would have come back into the economy and could have been channeled to the mining affected areas, both in the Northwest and in the Eastern Cape? And what a difference that could have made. Do you think um, it's, it boils down to a question of government's lack of will on the part of government to actually do the right thing? Well, I think that um, lack of will, lack of capacity. Um, what we find in the Department of Mineral Resources very often is that uh, critical individuals in the department who, who, who begin to ask the right questions and so, so on very often get offered jobs by the corporations and they disappear because the corporation can pay so much more than what the government can actually pay. We have confronted the Chamber of Mines about, about the issues of social and labour plans and so on. And they say, but we're paying millions to local governments, like Bojanala, for example. But the money just doesn't go anywhere. And what, we, what we have said to them is, but why are you paying out the money in lump sums? Why, are, why don't you link the money to specific projects and then you pay it in tranches as the project unfolds? They couldn't answer. And then you have Moss Parkway in Rustenburg, the councillor responsible for development, and he d d designs a whole file on, on corruption, mm -hmm. and the corruption probably involved the mining industry. Mm -hmm. He gets shot, mm -hmm. and the file disappears. The file should have been a central piece of evidence mm -hmm. at the Farlem Commission, mm -hmm. and the file should actually now come out again so that we can actually set things straight in this area and avoid a repetition of what we've just experienced. Mm -hmm. Lastly, and very, very briefly, given the problems you've outlined um, at all levels um, and involving all the players that we've spoken about, have we seen the last of the platinum strike type of strikes? I find it very hard to believe that there's going to be long-term stability in the industry so long as the extent of the inequality remains as it is and so long as the poverty conditions remain as they are. And that will only be changed through considerable state intervention to redress the balance. I, I also think that a whole lot of analysts have this morning poured 
petrol on the flames by bringing up this whole spectre of retrenchments. Mm. I think that it's completely unnecessary. If mines want to retrench workers and mothball certain shafts, those shafts should be taken away and given to people who can actually operate them. I think to threaten both the state and workers with this issue of retrenchment really, really is unfair by an industry that has milked this country for a very long time. Gentlemen, unfortunately, we've run out of time. And that's where we come, that's how we come to the end um, of uh, this evening's show. Join us again tomorrow evening, same time.